Late summer is an important time of the year for wild food foraging. Now our woodlands and our hedgerows are really important sources of food for us as we try to become self-sufficient. And in this edition of Self-Sufficient in Suburbia, we're going to have a look at how the weather has affected some of those wild food crops. But we're also going to dip into the history books to try out an old recipe that some of our older viewers may remember from the war years. But first, it's time to put ourselves on show. <laughs> Well, it's a lovely sunny day in September. Perhaps we're getting an Indian summer. Well, we're here in a village called Bowes at their annual agricultural show. And for the first time ever, we've entered the jam competition. But not only that, we've also entered the egg competition as well. First time we've ever done this. Not sure whether we're going to win anything. We're up against seasoned jam makers who go in for competitions, but who knows, let's see what happens. <laughs> oh, these are the uh, eggs that we've entered. Uh, four of our eggs from our columbines, but the next one along green eggs as well. So, what competition for the greenest egg? Well, that's my jar of raspberry and red currant chutney in the chutney section and we're up against mainly apple and onion chutneys which are a couple there and we've got a, an apple and tomato and one gooseberry chutney to compete with as well. That's my raspberry jam in the raspberry jam section. Uh, it's still one to arrive, but next to it, in the other jam section, we've got my blackberry jam there. <coughs> and we're up against rhubarb, blackcurrant, peach, and strawberry and rhubarb. Well, that's my lemon curd there, and. Uh, these are the others. Now in the jar of jelly section, that's my rowan jelly, and it's up against another rowan jelly there. And we've got a gooseberry and elderflower jelly, but a couple of entries still to come. This is the single egg competition. I'm not sure why we didn't enter this one. Uh, I think I will do next year. Find out later how we got on at the show. Now, food foraging. If you want to become self-sufficient, one th thing you need to do is to learn about nature's bounty. There's a free larder of food out there to be picked. So let's take a look at how some of the wild food crops that we would normally be picking at this time of year have been getting on. This year seems to have broken all the records in terms of the weather. Now we started with the driest and warmest winter that we've had for decades and then we went into the wettest and coldest spring that we've had for a century and then the summer, <laughs> what bit we had of it, in July it was wet and it followed a very wet and miserable June as well. Now that has an impact on the crops that we grow ourselves but also it has an impact on the wild foods that we go foraging for as well. So what we've come down to do here in Lottie's Wood which is a woodland next to our village in Sunnyside is we're going to have a look at some of the wild foods that we go picking and see what the weather has caused. Whether it's caused them to grow better or whether it's actually stopped them from growing at all. Well we're going to start with the good news and that's the hazel. Now as you can see lots of hazelnuts on the tree here 
Now that's important to us, very important, because hazel is one of the most important crops that we pick in the autumn. Hazelnuts are full of essential oils, but also very high in protein. So it's always one of the big crops that I go out and pick in September and October time. They produce catkins in the early spring and they are wind pollinated. They're not dependent on the bees to come out and pollinate them. And what we think has happened is that the catkins were out when it was still the dry uh, end and sunny end of the winter and early spring. They beat the heavy rains. Well, this is a rowan, uh, sometimes called mountain ash, and quite popular with councils for planting because they have a lot of nice blossom in the spring and they come out with these bunches of red berries in the late summer and autumn. So they're slightly later this year. Very really useful for making a jelly with, uh, very high in pectin. Uh, they have a very bitter taste to them, so you can't eat them raw, but cooked in jellies, they're, they're very good. Crop this year is, is not too bad. I've seen better, but I have already been out to pick some of these and already used them for making a jelly, so this one, not too bad. Well, these are blackberries. Now, when I was a kid, the blackberry picking season used to be a lot later than it is now. We used to have half term at school was uh, was known as Blackberry Week, which was in October. In more recent years, the blackberries have been ripening up here in late July, and I've been picking them throughout August. Well, this year uh, we're now at the end of August, and I've barely found any ripe ones at all. Now the overall crop seems to be reasonable. It's not fantastic, but. One of the interesting things is that the weather seems to have knocked them back, certainly in the, 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 the timing that they've taken to ripen compared to recent years. Oddly, compared to what it was a few decades ago, it's more on a natural cycle that you would expect from blackberries. Nevertheless, blackberries are important to us because they're very juicy and therefore they make very good, they're very good for adding into uh, jellies to, get the, to use the juice in them and also good for pies and uh, crumbles. Uh, so at the minute, we haven't had any blackberry pies, but I'm hoping to have one or two of those in the next few days. Well, these three trees here are cherry trees. Now, normally by the end of June, early July, then the cherry crop is more or less uh, gone. Uh, if you haven't picked them yourself, then the wood pigeons have normally got them. But this year, there have been hardly any cherries. Now, I suspect it's not necessarily down to the weather. What we think is happening is that they've been blighted by some kind of fungus. And these trees here, they've still got their leaves on, but behind me, you can see that a lot of the leaves have gone from the trees. Now, it's the end of August, and uh, the trees should still be covered in leaves. And it's some kind of fungus, we think, that's actually blighting the, the cherry trees. So we've had no cherry crop at all this year. These are sloes or blackthorn and last year and the year before we had a really really good crop of sloes and this year there is hardly anything on any of the sloes, uh, the slow bushes that I've seen in any of the hedgerows or any of the woodlands and we think that that was the one that was the victim of the heavy rains in the spring. Basically they were out flowering just as the heavy rains were falling and the flowers and the blossom got absolutely hammered. If it didn't get hammered by the rain then the bees weren't coming out, the pollinators weren't coming out and therefore there has been virtually no slows this year. So unfortunately there's going to be no slow gin this year either. Now this is a hawthorn and in the late summer and the autumn the hawberries come out and you can see a few of them here. Now this year uh, there is, obviously there are some hawberries available to pick but not that many. Uh, it's certainly compared to previous years the crop is going to be a lot less this time. Now hawberries are very good for making jellies and they're very high in pectin 
so we use them in making things like hedgerow jelly where we add them in to uh, fruits such as blackberries which are low in pectin helps them to set, helps the jellies to set. Uh, we will be able to pick some of these this year but uh, there's not just not going to be the quantity that we had last year so again this is one that's been hit by the spring rains hawthorn uh, flowers in May and it got a real hammering from the heavy rains. We don't pick acorns very often uh, we have once or twice made flower from the acorns. Now these are quite young trees uh, and last year they did have acorns on these oak trees. This year I've not seen any. Uh, now I've not done a full check on all the mature oak trees in the area so it may be that it's just uh, these young oaks that aren't producing any acorns. Uh, but I've just spotted as we've got here uh, what looks like some kind of fungus or mildew that's killing all the young leaves which is a bit worrying because I look over that side as well uh, and I can see oak trees and it looks as though uh, something's affecting the, the young leaves on those trees as well so I don't know what it is it could be just that it's just this woodland that's uh, having a problem or it may be sort of general weather conditions that have caused this. We'll have a bit more about wild food foraging later in the programme. Now, our tomato crop this year has not been particularly good. In fact, I'm actually dusting down some of my old green tomato chutney recipes because I'm not convinced that what few tomatoes we have will ripen. However, one of the things that we've learned to do in becoming self-sufficient is that if you're short of something, learn to trade with somebody else. And what we've done is swap jam for tomatoes with some of the other allotment holders recently other allotment holders who are a little bit better at growing tomatoes than we are and we took the tomatoes back to the kitchen to make them into tomato soup okay back it in the kitchen and first job chop a stalk of celery one red pepper and one medium to large onion and then add them into a pan on a low heat and lightly cook them for about five minutes. Once you're waiting for the vegetables to lightly cook, chop up a kilo of tomatoes and also make up a litre of stock. Now this is vegetable stock, it's up to you what type of stock that you use. So it could be a meat stock or a vegetable stock. But after the vegetables have been lightly fried, add in the tomatoes. And then stock and then some dried herbs from the garden we're putting in four bay leaves and some dried herbs and two cloves of garlic and then as an optional extra just a slight whiz of Tabasco sauce and then we're going to put the heat back up to bring this up to the boil. Once it's come up to the boil, turn the heat down and let it simmer for at least 20 minutes. The soup's had about 25 minutes in the pan now, so I'm just going to test it out, see how it comes out. simple straightforward recipe. What we'll do now is we'll simply blend it but we'll take the uh, the bay leaves out and I'll be having this for dinner tonight. The tomato soup was absolutely delicious. Anyway back to more on wild food foraging. Every August I come over to here, which is the Tanfield Railway footpath. It runs next to our village of Sunnyside. And the reason I'm attracted here is because of this tree. Now this is an apple tree. 
and normally in August and September it would take me five minutes to fill a carrier bag full of apples and then just pop home with them. There isn't a single apple on this tree. And it's nothing to do with somebody having beaten me to picking the apples. No apples developed on this tree at all. And it's the same up and down the country. The apple crop has been smashed to smithereens by the weather. And it's not just the ordinary apples, it's the crab apples as well. Uh, they, I've checked them on, on the hedgerows and there's virtually no crab apples at all. This really is a victim of this year's awful weather and it's going to cause us an awful lot of problems later in the year because we use apples in a lot of our cooking and in a lot of our preserves. So we're going to have to find alternatives. And in the meantime, the wildlife that relies on a lot of the fruit that grows wild as well, they're going to have a problem this autumn and winter as well because their food supply has been substantially diminished. This is elder and you can see some of the elderberries just starting to form up there. Now this year the elder flower was extremely late. Uh, normally we'd be looking at mid to late June as being the end of the elder flower season and I'll be rushing out to pick the elder flower to make the last elderflower drop scones or the elderflower champagne. Well this year it was July when the elderflower was in was flowering. Now that made it a bit easier for me to go out and pick it for making the champagne but these would normally now be much more ripe than they are and there'd be an awful lot more berries on these bunches than there are now. So yes we will get an elderflower, uh, sorry, an elderberry crop, but it's not going to be anywhere near as good as it normally is. And again, that's a bit of a problem for us because the elderberries are really you know, good for juice, which we can use in making syrups and jams and jellies. As I say, we will get some elderberry, but not a great deal. And again, it's one of those that seems to have fallen victim to the weather not as badly as the apples have but nevertheless it's not as good as it normally is and again the wildlife is going to suffer because the elderberries are very popular with things like the thrushes and the blackbirds in the autumn and without that crop that food they're going to suffer over the winter as well well these are rose hips and actually the rose hips aren't doing too badly this year these are the fruit of the roses very high in vitamin C and actually the, this afternoon I used a whole load of them to make some rose hip syrup. This is the bucket of rose hips I've just picked this afternoon. Now I remember when I was a kid my parents telling me about when they were kids during the war and they were given rose hip syrup. Now the reason kids during the war were given the syrup was because it was high in vitamin C but Britain wasn't importing any fresh fruit so no oranges no lemons and so on so we needed an alternative source of vitamin C now these rose hips here have per weight more vitamin C than oranges and lemons so we have right here on our doorsteps an excellent source of vitamin C during the war years there was a scheme run by the government under which volunteers could go out picked the rose hips and they were paid a penny a pound for them and they all went into factories to make vitamin to, to make rose hip syrup high in vitamin C which then went to be fed to the kids. It's a scheme that ended in 1950 and uh, I'm not suggesting that we bring back a scheme like that but what I am wanting to do is to encourage people to look at rose hips as an alternative to oranges for vitamin C and what we're going to do now is actually make some rose hip syrup using a warm, an old wartime recipe. You need two kilos of rose hips, chop them in half, put them in a jam pan and add three litres of water and bring it to the boil. Whilst the pan's heating up what I thought I'd do is show you the inside of a rose hip. Now as you can see the flesh is on the outside and right in the core as well and it's surrounded by a large number 
of seeds. Now the, the birds love the seeds and they will be, you often find when you're um, out picking rose hips that they, the birds have already been there and they've stripped open the, the rose hips. Uh, but as you can see the large numbers of seeds that the birds will eat but humans can't eat them. Uh, they're covered in a very fine hairs which make them indigestible and are quite an irritant as well. And I remember as kids what we used to do was uh, used to split open uh, these uh, rose hips and put the seeds down people's backs uh, and uh, use it as a niching powder. It was, it was great fun but very annoying uh, to the person who got caught um, with the seeds put down the back of their neck. Um, and not that I'm suggesting that people should do it now but uh, it was great fun when we were kids. Once the pans come up to the boil, leave it to simmer for about five minutes. You then need to strain it through a jelly bag. It should take about an hour to strain it and at that point put the pulp back in the pan, another three litres of water, bring it up to the boil, simmer for five minutes and then repeat the process of straining it through the jelly bag. The pulp has been straining for 24 hours now so the liquid is now ready to be measured, then put it back into the pan. You then need to add 650 grams of sugar for every litre of liquid and then heat it up, stirring it to make sure the sugar is dissolved. As it's coming up to the boil you might find that this sort of scummy layer forms all you need to do is spoon that off and then let the liquid boil for about three minutes. Well, here's a couple of the 14 bottles we've just made of rosehip syrup. Now what can it be used for? Well you could uh, drink it neat as a just if you're wanting something sweet a spoonful of it would go down very well or you can drizzle it onto cakes put it onto pancakes maybe even mix it into rice pudding but if you want to be really naughty put a shot of gin or vodka into a glass some of the syrup onto it a couple of ice cubes and enjoy the drink. So how did we do at the show? Well, time to find out. Well, the judging's now finished and we're about to go in and find out how we've got on. Well, we've just got a first prize for the eggs. We've uh, just got ourselves a second prize for the other jams. That's a non-raspberry jam one, but along here another first prize for our Rowan Jelly. That's it from Self Sufficient in Suburbia for the end 
of summer. Join us in the next edition when we'll be visiting the Harrogate Flower Show. In the meantime, I'm going to leave you with a few additions that we have to self-sufficient in suburbia. A few days ago, we took delivery of three ducks and five ducklings. Ah, ah.